You know, if you play fantasy football, you know you really don't want any Jets on your team. Uh, Eric Decker's okay, but, uh, you know, for the most part, man, the Jets are just – Jets are in trouble again. Uh, even the quarterback they got rid of had a great week last week, Mark, Mark Sanchez. But, um, but Mark Pastore uh, is vice president of AES, EES, and he's going to be talking about the clean scrub um, system, about improving wet FG operations uh, to reduce chemical usage. Uh, he is a graduate of the State University of New York, and you'll be able to tell that when you hear him uh, hear him speak with his accent. I don't have an accent, by the way. Uh, so, uh, Mark, we look forward to uh, to your pr uh, to your presentation today. And here's your clicker. Thank you, Tim. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for not laughing too hard about the Jets, but they really are pathetic. Um, <laughs> So anyway, um, yeah, I want to talk about our clean scrub technology. This is um, uh, heavy metals and mercury precipitant for wet FGD or dry FGD systems. And um, you know, I've been I've been watching this mercury market since 2003 when I started with EES. And you know, when it first came out, it, it was looking like it was going to be incredibly expensive. Um, but of course, as time went by and people get their heads together and creativity comes about, you start to see how you can save money and do things a little differently. Well, the same thing happened with us when you're looking at precipitating the mercury from a wet FGD. Uh, you, you, you slowly find out that it's really, it really depends on how they operate the FGD. And then you can really minimize your chemical usage. And um, so before I get into that, presentation, I want to tell you a little bit about EES. So we, we concentrate on fuel flexibility initiatives for our customers, um, you know, getting, being able to allow our customers to burn lower rank coals. Um, everything we do has to do with chemistry. Um, our vision for the, the company is uh, innovative chemistry for energy efficiency. So we, we want to we want to save our customers money and we want to sell chemicals to do that. So if you look at our line here, for the emissions control side, we, we want to team up with experts in each one of their areas. So for SO2 mitigation, something a little different where we apply a micronized calcium carbonate into the furnace. Um, this is done through ClearChem. ClearChem is a small company with a patent on that technology that we've licensed. Um, we know the importance of oxidation of mercury for a wet FGD to perform properly to capture mercury. Um, we've partnered with ADAES, who is here today, on this Clean Scrub Plus. So they give us an option for an oxidizer when we need it. Um, one of our other partners, Carbonext, is here. Um, they have specialty non-halogenated activated carbons. So, so we have lots of different solutions for our customers and apply the best technology for, for that particular application. Um, SARIS is an advanced SNCR system which comes from step combustion. So we, we like to partner with people who are experts in their area, in their different fields. We also can do continuous monitoring. We, we have uh, a testing crew. We can do the EPA test methods. We have uh, SO3 monitoring which is a continuous online instrument. So this way we can back up anything we do with the chemicals. We have the test methods to, uh, to back that up. So now let's talk about the, the clean scrub. And, and my, my real focus today is to introduce you to the clean scrub chemistry, but also to talk about what we've learned over the last couple of years by working in the field on how improving your wet FGD operations before you even think about chemical addition is, is really the key to a successful mercury remediation program. So the, the clean scrub is a highly efficient sulfur-based chemistry. Um, this, this product really is specific for mercury. Um, the only thing it gets quicker than mercury in a water-based system is gold. So we, it's going to go after the mercury right away. It forms a large and stable precipitant. This way it can get swept away with the absorber solids and, and through all the testing we've done, we've seen that it does partition nicely from the water into the solid phase. And this is good with the, uh, 
the uh, ELG guidelines coming up. We, this is like the first step for your wastewater treatment. Get the metals out in the absorber, and then you have a better time with your, with your back end wastewater treatment. Um, the product is made in the USA. It's non-hazardous and non-corrosive. And, and to apply it is quite simple. It's, I'll show you pictures of it, but it's, it's, a, it's a low dosage level. It's a small little pumping system. Very easy to maintain and easy to handle. Um, so besides getting the mercury, you, there's a host of two plus transition metals and heavy metals that it will also remediate. This is what the molecule looks like. So it's, it's, um, it's a sodium based salt of this polysulfide. And uh, the nice thing about that is it, it will react, two moles of the clean scrub react with three moles of mercury. So we have a little bit of an advantage on the, uh, on the actual dosage level for how much mercury it could bind up. It'll bind on the uh, sites where, where, the sulf where the sodium was on these two sides and then also it can resonate between the double bonds here and, and, uh, and form a nice tight bond. So that big molecule is, is easy to precipitate. It sweeps away nicely with the scrubber solids. This is what the equipment looks like. Um, once again, it's a small, small system, and uh, it can be fed from totes of the chemical or small, small storage tank, and it goes right into the uh, absorber recycle loop. So we want to be on the lowest um, absorber uh, spray, spray tower, so the lowest level because we want to be right by the interface where the, uh, where the gas meets the top of the, of the reservoir. Um, we, we employ a sulfide specific ion electrode probe in the, uh, in the absorber solution. This will pick up any excess clean scrub chemical and it's an easy way to, to uh, control the dosage of the chemical. So when, the, when it sees excess S minus ions, it will shut the system off and when that number goes up, it'll turn the system on. It's very easy to control. So what we've learned, uh, we've learned a lot of things about scrubber operation over the, over the years working with this chemical. And, and if you look at this example, this is one of the early tests that we did. You know, we were in a high ORP environment, about 600 ORP. And there's a lot of talk in the industry about what ORP is and can you control, you know, your, your re-emission with ORP and, and, and basically what we've found out is the ORP is directly related to how much chemical you have to use. And, and we used to call this a conditioning period where we found we'd have to add a lot of chemical into the absorber before it would actually work. Well, it's really not a conditioning period as much as it is High ORP means you're going to consume the chemical. The oxygen that's dissolved in that, in that solution is actually consuming the sulfur chemistry. And this doesn't only go for our chemistry. There's lots of different sulfide chemistries out there. But so here we were at 5 to 10 gallons an hour. We achieved the, mer the uh, mass compliance, got the customer down to 0.8. But, you know, we were using a lot of chemical. It, it, it was expensive. And... Um, the one thing, the other thing we found out along the way was the importance of oxidation. So the only way to precipitate the metal from the water is if it's oxidized. It has to be HG2+, so it dissolves in the water. Um, we, we discovered that in, in one case where the, the coal changed during one of our trials from a high chloride to a very low chloride. And if you look at the graph here, the green line is our specific ion electrode, the S minus. And the uh, blue line is the mercury. And the red is HCl. The HCl was continuously monitored. So here we're adding our chemical in the beginning. And uh, I think the pointer just died on me. Anyway, do we have another pointer? Actually, press, press that hard right there. Oh, there it goes. OK. Sorry about that. So. Um, so here we're adding the chemical and nothing's happening. The mercury is still stable. Then the chlorine drops and the mercury, nothing's happening again, but we are conditioned. I can't get this thing to work, but sorry. So the green line came down. That means we have enough chemical in the system. It should be precipitating the mercury, but it's not. 
until the chloride goes up here on the right side of the chart. As soon as the high chlorine cold came back, the mercury dropped down. So that was, uh, that was a really important discovery. And we also wanted to know what, what the chlorine was actually doing. Okay. No, that one doesn't have a laser. No, so. Oh, all right. Well, I'll just. He's changing batteries. Sorry. Okay. All right. So again, here, here, this is a low ORP scrubber. So now we have nothing to compete with our chemistry. Look at the clean scrub level. One gallon per hour is all we needed to uh, to to take the mercury down below the the uh, the mats requirement, all the way on the right. What, what we see here in this test, what was important, all the way on the left, the mercury is, is high. As soon as he adds his uh, halogen, in this case it was a calcium bromide, um, the mercury drops down right to the, to the uh, mats level, and he's fine. Then, then he, he, he stops treating the coal, and they actually add the halogen to the absorber, and he got a decrease. So, we thought that it was oxidizing the mercury potentially in the absorber. Well, it turns out that wasn't really the case. You still have to oxidize it on the coal, but what you can do is by having the right halogen level in the absorber, it stabilizes the mercury in the solution, and that allows us to take it out. It won't re-emit if you can stabilize it. And I'm going to show you as we go along um, what other factors will help you stabilize the mercury to allow you to use less chemical. So here, in this particular case, this customer was having mercury spikes at low load. It's, it's continuous. You can, you can see the spikes every time the load drops. The blue line is the mercury. And as he adds the calcium bromide, he gets better and better mercury capture along, you know, as he raises the dosage. Each one of those sectors is, is raising the dose of the calcium bromide. Then he adds the clean scrub with, where the little green box is on the bottom, and then he gets way down, all the way down to you know, 0.3, way below the mat's limit. And um, so what, what we started to learn here was that increased halogens will stabilize the mercury in the solution. So, you know, you, you have to think about that when you're operating your absorber. You, you want to use the right amount, keep the right amount of halogens in that solution, in the absorber, um, and you can control that by controlling your blowdown rate. But you don't want to have minimum halogen levels in there if you want to have a stable mercury that doesn't re-emit. And then you put the clean scrub in and you reduce it even further. So here's, here's another example. So talking about that that spike of the mercury at low load, too much oxygen. So what, what do they do here? They are going to now control the amount of oxygen in the absorber, reduce the forced air ox levels, remove the upper sprays at low load. See, most people when they're operating their absorbers, it just, just operate them as is all the time. No matter what the load is, you're using all your recycle loops and, and you're, you're just maximizing your forced air because nobody thought about what that was doing to mercury in the past. So we want to bring this, you know, into the open here and let people think about it. But what, what they did here was at low load, they, they removed the upper sprays and they lowered the ox air and they, they suppressed the spikes at low load. And um, that was a really big discovery. And that really allows us to... Uh, to go here. Now the absorber is completely ready for the clean scrub at this point. They lowered their forced air, they controlled their mercury spikes at low load by, by uh, taking some spray zones out that weren't needed at low load. All of this enabled us to get the clean scrub down to just a few, it was one to two gallons per hour. And if you see on the right in the black box, that looks crazy the way it's going up and down. What, what happened here was we were actually introducing the chemical from the sump for the absorber. And the sump discharges every two hours into the absorber. And you can see we were down at 0.2. As soon as we discharged the clean scrub in the scrubber, then it would rise up. And then as soon as they discharge the, the sump, boom, it goes down. This 
this really showed us that conditioning is not necessary. We, we thought we had to add chemical and add chemical. The conditioning was just because the absorber had too much oxygen in it, and, it was, and, and we were competing. The oxygen destroys the clean scrub molecule, and it doesn't capture the mercury. So this, this is it right here, this, all in a nutshell. You can, you can, as long as you oxidize the mercury going in, and then you control your halogen level in the absorber, and you control your amount of forced air, you can use a very small amount of precipitant to meet your mass requirements. And so, in summary, oxidation is critical first step. You can do that with a special activated carbon. You can do that with a bromine. You can do that with a non-brominated product. There's lots of options. We would choose the best option for the customer, and, um, but that's critical. The mercury has to be oxidized and oxidized well. Second, scrubber operations. And this is the new part of it. Um, you really have to look at maintaining as low an oxygen level as you can. Keep your sulfite levels as high as allowed. I know that some of you have to sell your gypsum. You're limited on your sulfites, but you want to maximize that. You want to push it to the maximum level that's allowed in that, in that gypsum. And you want to maintain your halogen levels as high as you can possibly do that. I know some of you might struggle with corrosion problems. Others may not. But try to maximize your halogen level. You do those three things, and you will be achieving your mercury compliance with a lot less dollars than what you thought you would have. And uh, thank you very much. We're gonna have, we've got time for a few questions. Uh, let's give him a hand. Got time for uh, a few questions. If you if you'll stand up, can uh, if we can have that mic out there, and state your name, where you're from, your favorite NFL team, and what your question is. Uh, Sam Najem, Oglethorpe Power, here in Atlanta. Um, so yeah, I feel sorry for our Atlanta Falcons as well. So. <laughs> uh, I had a question about selenium. I didn't see selenium up there. Did you guys test for that, and to see if there's any reduction there, because uh, that would help the effluent guidelines as well. Sure. Um, the only, unfortunately, the selenium works the opposite of mercury when it comes to precipitants, like our sulfide chemistry. So to use the clean scrub for selenium is not really a good option. Um, the only time we ever saw selenium removal was when we were in a particular absorber that had a uh, minus 150 ORP. It was an extremely reduced environment. Um, and in that case, the clean scrub didn't catch any mercury, but precipitated all the selenium. But that's a rarity. That doesn't exist <laughs> in the regular world. So what we do for selenium is we, we work with a high pressure reverse osmosis system and ion exchange. So when I talked about the clean scrub um, doing the first part of, of your wastewater, I meant you know cleaning out those metals in the absorber, sweeping them away and then you have a cleaner water that you can go to a high pressure RO and that's what David Martin from ProChem, he can talk to you about that but that's what we do for selenium. Another question from the audience. Come on. Okay, great. Uh, let's have a mic here because uh, we're filming. Here we go. Go ahead, sir. Hi, I'm Bob Gilly of Vostavila. Hi. Of course, Patriots is my team. So uh, I'm, I'm up north, uh, like you. But it's just a very obvious question, how much does it cost? How much does the clean chem chemical cost? Um, the clean scrub chemical, it, you know, it, it ranges, uh, it's around uh, $2 a pound. It goes in in a small level. So a typical, if you could keep your scrubber operations in, like I said, and, and tune it up so you use a minimal amount of chemical, you could be ranging from a quarter of a million to $400,000 a year in the clean scrub use for a 400 to 600 megawatt range. It's a bargain. All right. Other, any other questions? All right, great. Thank you very much.